I want to get right to it. Isaiah chapter 40, if you've got your Bibles with you, we'll be starting in verse 27. It says, O Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard? Have you never understood? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Come on, somebody. Even youth will become weak and tired, and young men will fall in exhaustion. Here it is. This is the verse of scripture. You've all probably heard this. I want to lean into this verse of scripture today, but those who trust in the Lord, somebody say trust. I like the new King James version. It says those who wait on the Lord. Somebody say wait in the house of God. Those who wait on the Lord will find new strength or renewed strength. Anybody need new strength or renewed strength in here today? The Bible says that if we'll wait and trust on him, he'll give us new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. The title of today's message is Waiting Works, Finding New Strength for Life. God, we come to you right now and we just confess with our mouths that there are things we're believing for. Many of us in this room, in one area of our life or another, can say that we're waiting on you. And we admit in this moment that waiting can become weariness. Some of us in here are tired. We're doubting. We're wondering if you see us or if you care for us or if you're gonna move. And so in the next few moments, we just pray that you would encourage our hearts, that you would teach us how to be a, tr a church that not just begins our race, but finishes it. That doesn't just walk by faith, but walks with fortitude. We pray that you would strengthen us in our waiting seasons. In Jesus' name, amen. So the month of June is when my family takes a sabbatical. And so this past month, we got some amazing time together. And for the past year, our kids have just been hounding us about going to the ocean. Like, Mommy, Daddy, can we see the ocean? And uh, my wife and I, we were, we've been discussing this, and so we decided to muster up enough courage to pack them in a car and take them to Siesta Key, Florida. 22 and a half hour drive. Now, thankfully, Nashville, Tennessee, is about 11 hours away, basically right in the middle. And so we were able to break up the drive in two days. And I just gotta tell you, man, God's grace was on the drive down. I couldn't believe it. For those of you that don't know me, I've got three kids under the age of seven. Most of the time, I don't feel like a father, I feel like a referee. Anybody with me with young children? Yeah, I see the hands. Lord bless them in Jesus' name. So we make it to Siesta Key, Florida. We have this amazing time together. It was, it was redemptive for our family. Last year was a very difficult year that began in the month of June. This year, we just had an incredible time away. We didn't really do much in Florida other than go see the beautiful beaches of Florida. In Siesta Key, it's white sand, blue water. I mean, it was amazing. Well, after being there for seven days, we had to make the trek back. Now, the trek down is always better because you're like, we're going to Florida. It's exciting. But now after a week vacation, the last thing I wanted to do was drive 22 and a half hours back. Is anybody with me? Well, I knew that we were going to break the trip up and stop in Nashville, Tennessee again. And we happened to be leaving on a Tuesday. Now, why does this matter? Because Tuesday night in Nashville, Tennessee, there's a church called Belonging Co., they do Tuesday night services to serve the people that are serving in the industry there. So this is beautiful. I'm like, family, we will be in the car at 5.30 a.m. because I will be in that auditorium when the first note hits in Nashville, Tennessee, because I believe I'm gonna receive a word from the Lord. <laughs> How many of y'all have expectations in life? Plans. This is how it's going to go. 
So we get in the car, and I just gotta tell you, we had to trade out the rental car we went down in, and we had to come back in a truck. So now I'm making a 22 and a half hour drive, and all three kids are right next to each other. Yeah, talk about praying in the spirit. I was. I'm like, God, I need your grace for this drive. We get 45 minutes down the road. It's torrential downpour. I'm like 10 and 2 clenching the steering wheel. It felt like my forearms were going to pop out of my arms. Anybody with me? I don't like driving in the rain. Don't judge me. So we hit one accident. We're going like 35 with the flashers on. I mean, it's a little bit scary, dicey. I'm like, do I pull off? Do I keep going? I'm like, I'm going. I've got a word to receive from God in Nashville, Tennessee. Well, we get about two miles down the road, and there's sheriffs that are causing everybody to get off the exit. So I'm thinking to myself, what's going on here? Like, why are they redirecting traffic off the one interstate on the west side of Florida? So I get out my phone as I'm in traffic and I'm looking at Google, why I-75 shut down? And I find out that about two miles ahead of where they were causing us to get off the exit, there was a semi that was carrying chemicals that rolled. So I'm thinking to myself, it's all good. A 30-minute detour, we'll be on our way. I will be standing in the front row receiving a word from the Lord in Nashville, Tennessee. How many stubborn people in the house of God? So we're in traffic. They're redirecting us. I mean, we are bumper to bumper for two and a half hours to get nine miles down the road with more rain ahead and more stops. What was supposed to be an 11-hour drive turned into 17 and a half hours round one. The only word I was receiving was off my iPhone because I didn't make it to Nashville, Tennessee that night. I can tell you, there were, when, 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 when 30 minutes passed by and then an hour, I started getting real frustrated. Oh, quit acting spiritual like you are like be, waiting in lines and waiting in traffic. Is anybody with me? Come on. Does that frustrate you? I started thinking about this uh, story this week and just life and I don't know about you, but I know that in a room this size, there's many of you that find yourself in a waiting season. And waiting can become frustrating. Waiting can become a burden. Waiting can make us tired. Is anybody with me? I've just, I've just realized, especially in our culture today, we don't like to wait for nothing. That's why people created TSA PreCheck. Amazon Prime, Grubhub. I mean, you don't even get got to get out of your recliner now to eat a meal. Disney Fast Pass, glory to God, whoever created that. <laughs> We're creating solutions because we don't like to wait. As a matter of fact, now I've been noticing lately that when I'm stopped at a red light, if, when, as soon as that thing turns green and you don't go, somebody is laying on their horn. I mean, this was reinforced during our time uh, down in Florida. So let me tell you this story. This is crazy. And this just proves my point, that we come out of the womb impatient. So my three-year-old son, we just spent six hours at the beach. How many of you know walking from the car to the beach is a lot better than walking from the beach to the car? Especially after six hours in the Florida sun, you got sand all over you, you're sweaty, you're a little bit frustrated, and here we are walking back to our car. We get back to our car. The car is hotter than it is outside. We're all angry. We're all tired. We all need a shower, and we definitely need some food. Anybody with me? So I look to my wife, and I say, there is no way we're going to shower and go out to dinner. We need to pick up some food on the way home, and we are staying in tonight. Hello, somebody. So I pull out my phone. I'm like, we're ordering Chipotle to pick up on the way home. And I'm getting my app out and I'm fumbling around and I'm trying to figure out what everybody wants to order. And I'm sitting there ordering for like five, six, seven minutes. People are starting to get frustrated. I'm like, chill out. All of a sudden, out of the back, you would not believe what I heard. My three-year-old with his little raspy voice says, can we get the hell out of here? (laughs) 
I didn't know whether to laugh or look at my wife and say, are we even saved? If you think you're failing at parenting, I'm sorry that at church, I don't mean to let you down, but my goodness, I was holding back a laugh and simultaneously asking myself, where did he learn that? I started judging my wife. Have you been talking like that? Surely it's not me because I'm a righteous man of God. It was real quick that we realized he got it off home alone. So be careful what you expose your children to. Now, here's the real question I was asking. How did he know how to use that in context? Is anybody else asking that question? I think this is a perfect picture for how some of us feel right now. Can we just get out of here? God, you don't even see me in this season. Are you even there? I just want to escape. I want to run. I want to go. I just want to get the out of here. Come on, can we be real in church today? Is anybody tempted to feel that? What's interesting about this text in Isaiah chapter 40 is what we recognize is this is right where the people of God were. In chapters 1 through 39 of this particular book, Isaiah is writing to the Israelites in their current reality. The world power at the time was the nation of Assyria. But then there's a shift. In 39, he begins to prophesy of their future exile to Babylon. So this is crazy. This is how cool the Holy Spirit is. He begins to foretell what would happen to God's people. And Isaiah begins speaking to that future reality. Are you catching that with me? So he's speaking now. He's starting to turn the page and starting to speak to their future when they would be in exile. Now, those of us that know the scriptures, we know that God's people went into captivity in Babylon for how long, Josh? 70 years. Can you imagine that waiting season? How weary God's people must have been? They know that God had said that they were the chosen generation, that favor was upon them. And I bet they were thinking, God, where are you? What does this look like? Has anybody been there? Has anybody questioned God's faithfulness and his favor in a season of waiting? Now, last week I was in worship and I felt like the Holy Spirit whispered something to me that I really feel like he wants me to share with our church today. But I felt like what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me is he said, it's in the waiting seasons where you develop fortitude and you're going to need fortitude to finish your race. I don't know about you, friends, but something that is burdening my heart, I mean, to the point of tears in Florida, I was thinking of young people that God saved, that he raised up, that had a call on their life, that began walking with Jesus only for a few years later to start drifting away from him. This burdens my heart. I want to see people finish their race like Ken. Pastor Todd shared his story. Ken went to be, to be with the Father. He, he passed away at 345 yesterday, and now he's in glory in heaven. And a few short weeks ago, he was up here with a deadly disease, worshiping his way to heaven. I don't know about you, friends, but that's how I want to finish my race. How about you? Waiting works. Sometimes God is writing his best stories in the waiting. There's character that is, that is being developed inside you and I. And so many of us, we want something before we're ready. That's why people are overexposed and underdeveloped, and they get the thing, and they can't keep the thing. We got to keep that thing. We got to learn how to wait on the Lord. And I think there's some principles that he wants to give us today. Number one is this. If you're a note taker, write this down. If you and I want to find new strength as we wait on the Lord, we need to, number one, fix our focus on Jesus. Fix our focus on Jesus. Right about now, just go ahead and slap your neighbor, wake him up and say, are you focusing? Fix your focus on Jesus. And you might be asking, how do we fix our focus on Jesus? Here it is. We fix our focus on Jesus by fixing our focus on the word. You fix your focus on Jesus 
by fixing your focus on the word. See, when I was growing up, church was something we did. It was a place that we went. I didn't recognize that the church didn't exist for me, but I was actually the church in Christ and I existed for the world. I didn't understand that God wanted a relationship with me. I thought it was just a place I was supposed to show up, rules I was supposed to follow. But here's what I've realized, friend, is what Jesus is inviting us into is something so much greater than that, something so much better than that. And you and I can find strength that will anchor us in the midst of every battle that we walk through if we'll get into the word of God. We've got to fix our focus on Jesus by fixing our focus on the word. John chapter one, check it out. I love this verse of scripture. It's so powerful. It says this, in the beginning, the word already existed. The word was with God and the word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him and nothing was created except through him. And nothing was created except through him. The word gave life to everything that was created and his life brought light to everyone. Listen, the word is Jesus. Do you see, the, do you see this? If you want to find Jesus, look no further than your word. Some of you are saying, where are you, God? Are you in your word? Jesus, have you left me? Open your Bible. Where are you, God? Take it off the shelf. Jesus, I need you. Dust that thing off this week and get your nose in the word. Come on, somebody. The secret place is the secret sauce. And if you want to fix your focus on Jesus, you need to fix your focus on the word. Isaiah 40, verse 8. Isaiah confirms this when he says, The grass withers and the flowers fade. But the word of our God, what? It stands forever. If you want your life to be built on sand, just keep doing what you're doing. But if you want your life to be built on the firm foundation, come on somebody, you need to build a life that is rooted in the word of God. Jesus invited you to follow him. That means you go where he goes. And you can't follow if your focus isn't fixed. I like to say this, what you see determines how you step. Can I get an amen? amen? He invited us to follow him. And the Bible says that he keeps in perfect peace those whose minds stay what? Fixed on him. Fixed on him. This takes discipline. This takes commitment. This takes conviction. And how many of you know, in this life, in our flesh, we're drifting towards what? Our comfort, not our convictions. Today, I want to tell somebody, you got to crucify your comfort and get your convictions back. Do you feel that today? Do you feel that today? If you and I are going to wait well, we got to fix our focus on Jesus. And I think that many of us in our culture today are being distracted distracted by circumstances, distracted by media. We are overstimulated and under discipline and distraction is all around us. There's so much noise. It makes me think about, um, I'm going to go back to Home Alone, Home Alone 2. Yeah, y'all are never going to forget that story, are you? Home Alone 2, they wake up late and they're rushing to the airport Remember, in Home Alone 1, Kevin didn't even make it to the airport. This time he makes it. They're in a mad rush towards their gate. Does anybody remember where they were going? Miami is where they're going. So they're heading to Miami. The whole family is busting through the airport. And in a moment, Kevin gets distracted and he begins fumbling around. And he kind of looks up and he can see his dad. But every time he gets distracted and looks away, his father gets further and further away from him. I think this has happened to some of us. We were following, faithfully following the Father, faithfully fixing our focus on Jesus, and then we got a little bit distracted, and we thought to ourselves, well, I can still kind of see what he's up to. Like, I'm still coming on Sundays, so I still kind of, you know, me and God are cool and stuff. Well, we all know how the story goes. What ends up happening, and this is what I want to tell somebody. When you get your eyes off of Jesus, you become even more vulnerable to deception, 
because Kevin begins following a lookalike. He was supposed to go with his father to Miami. He ended up following a lookalike and he ended up in New York. I think some of you are in New York right now when you're supposed to be in Miami. You got to fix your focus on Jesus. Come on, church. Is anybody with me today? We got to fix our focus on Jesus as we wait on the Lord. Because you will mount up with wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and you will not faint. Waiting works when we fix our focus on Jesus. And number two, when we remind ourselves of the greatness of God. So we find new strength in our waiting seasons when we remind ourselves of the greatness of God. How many of you know that it's so easy to allow our circumstances or the things that we desire to be in closer proximity, to, to take up more space in our mind than the goodness and greatness of God? And when we see God through our circumstances, he appears small and far away. But when we see our circumstances through God, God seems close and willing to overcome. Is anybody with me today? I like to say circumstances are just those nasty things you see when you take your eyes off of God. We got to see the greatness of God. We got to remind ourselves. So many of us are listening to ourselves. We're not talking to ourselves. I don't know about you, but sometimes I got to look myself in the mirror and just start preaching to myself. Don't you give up, O.C. Do not fret in doing good, for at the proper time you'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. Don't forget that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all things will be added unto you. You are hidden in Christ, and what is his in heaven is yours. You are seated on thrones in heaven. You are a son. You're not a slave. You are chosen. You are a son. You are favored. You are blessed. Come on, is anybody with me? You got to talk to yourself, not listen to yourself. I got to remind myself of the goodness and greatness of God, especially when I'm weary. Especially when I'm weary. And Isaiah does this. We didn't cover it yet, but I want to read a few verses for you. Isaiah 40, 12 through 15 says this. Who else has held the oceans in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Is anybody else's mind just blown right about now? Who is able to advise the spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? I'm just reading this going, what? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. Listen, God is greater than anything on earth or in heaven. Creation shows his wisdom, power, and vastness. He is greater than all nations and their gods. He is the founder of earth, sits on thrones of heaven, and he has no equal. And yet we wonder how we're going to pay our bills next week. Or how that womb's going to be filled. Or ladies, you're waiting on your man. That's my God. He holds the world in the palm of his hands. And you're saying to me right now, oh, see, you're just proving my point. He's got bigger fish to fry. He's up to bigger stuff. How many of you know that he knows the names of every star just like he knows your name? He knows the hair. He knows the amount of hairs on your head. And the Bible says that he thinks more thoughts about you than sand on the seashore. So he's a big God who holds the world in the palm of his hand, who created this world. But he, but he, he longed for us to come into the world. He has a plan and purpose for you. He sees you. You might not be drawing near to him, but he's drawing you. That's why you're in this place today. He's not done with you yet. And I don't know where you find yourself today, but when you're in a season of weariness, when you're in a season of waiting, you need to remind yourself how great your God is, how good your God is. Because when you behold the greatness of God, then you will see everything else in your life in its proper perspective. 
Do you see what I'm saying? It's about proper perspective. That's why I love this, this verse of scripture that says, those who wait on the Lord will have what? Renewed strength, they will mount up on wings like eagles. What's so interesting is what you discover and learn about eagles is their wings are so heavy that they have to rely on the wind from God to cause them to rise. They can't flap too much or it could lead to their death. They just soar. Talk about perspective. This is what God wants to do in your life. And this is what happens. When you start to see how big and great your God is, your circumstances get smaller. But when you make your circumstances big, now your God looks small. We got to get back to the greatness of God if we're going to walk through a season of waiting. Like Chris Tomlin says, our God is greater, our God is stronger. Come on, don't make me feel like a fool. Our God is higher than other Okay, so y'all want to know which encounter won the award for best performance, Chris Tomlin, Our God is Greater? And the answer is 5 p.m. last night, <laughs> about half this room. I just had to do that because I wanted the people online to hear your beautiful voices today. But it's true. Our God is greater. He's stronger. And this is part of persevering. This is part of building fortitude. Waiting works when we have proper perspective, and a big piece of that is what? Number one, fixing our focus on who? On who? Fixing our focus on who? And reminding ourselves of his what? His what? Are you getting it today? His greatness. And here's number three. Here's number three. We're going to believe God for the outcome we want, but trust him for the outcome that we need. By a show of hands, who is believing God for something in this place today? Raise them nice and high, because for some reason in church, we walk in and we think, I'm the only person. Look around. Everybody, just keep your hand up. Look around. So if you're believing God for something, raise your hand. Look, man, almost everybody in this place. I'm going to ask you a second question. Who in here has a desired outcome for that circumstance or situation? Raise your hand. Yeah, right? Believing God for what we want, trusting him for what we need. I want to break off this mindset that I feel like we can drift into as Christians of where we like tiptoe and we kind of, we, we, we start to approach God as orphans rather than as sons. The Bible says to come boldly before the throne of grace. The Bible says, ask and you shall receive. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not promoting a prosperity gospel. What I am saying, though, is that he wants us to live an abundant life. And he's a good father. Any moms or dads in here in this place? You don't rebuke your kids when they come and they ask boldly. Recently, Judah asked me if we could get a basketball hoop, and he's been kind of hounding me. Finally, this June, we surprised him with one. And it was like the greatest feeling as a dad. And if that's what I feel as an earthly dad, what does our heavenly father feel? So the first thing I want to say to somebody is it's okay to have a desire. The Bible actually says he will give you the desires of your heart. We got to be willing to dream again, believe again, come boldly before his throne of grace and put it before him. Now, here's what I want to teach us. Sometimes he understands a bigger picture. He's got a bigger story in mind. And you see what you want, which is your desire, but he sees what you need. So the question I need to ask us today is if he doesn't give you what, he want, what you want, is he still good? My answer is yes, he is. I want to illustrate this from Acts chapter 3. I think it's a beautiful picture. In Acts chapter 3, there's a lame man that's sitting outside the temple and Peter and John walk up. The Bible describes this moment as this lame man looking intently at Peter and John. And, and the Bible says that he was expecting money from them. So this lame man is sitting there and he's got an expectation. 
He wants money. Now, why does he want money? Because he, because he needs a meal. He wants money for a meal. Because in that day, when you were lame, nobody would hire you. So he had to beg for money so that he could buy food and survive. Peter looks at him and says, I don't have silver or gold, but what I do have in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, get up and walk. He lifts this dude up and it says that as he stands, his ankle and his feet are miraculously healed. We got one person that appreciates that. He wanted a meal, but God had a miracle in motion. So here's what I want to tell somebody today. Don't settle for the meal when God wants to do a miracle. He wanted money for the moment. God wanted to do a miracle. Now, here's the beautiful thing about the story is they could have given him silver or gold and he would have ate that night. But because he was healed, now he could go get a job and he could be fed for the rest of his life. God is doing a bigger thing in this season of waiting. So believe him for what you want, but trust him to give you what you need. Begin asking him, God, what do I need? What do I need? I remember when I was in a season of life where this was true of my life. Many of you know my story. My dream as a little guy was to play in the NFL. I had to work out with the Miami Dolphins. They didn't sign me. I came back to the Midwest and played in the UFL for the Omaha Nighthawks. And then after my first season of professional football, I moved out to Los Angeles. God tells me to pick up everything and move to Omaha. No job, no place to live. I just came here on a call. I landed here July 2nd, 2012. Well, how many of you know about a year after being here, there's a team in Italy that calls me and they say, hey, we want to bring you over here. They were offering me an opportunity to play football, to keep the dream alive, baby. We'll pay for your living. We'll give you a car, a cell phone. We'll pay you a little bit of money. Oh, and by the way, when you're not playing football, you can travel throughout the country. I'm thinking, sign me up today. Where do I sign? But as a man of God does, I took it before the Lord. I was praying. I'll never forget this moment. I was at Stories Coffee House, the old school stories on a Thursday night when I felt like the Holy Spirit said, I told you to hang up your cleats a year ago. Don't pick those things back up. It's so interesting and I'm so thankful because what I wanted was to keep the dream alive, but what I needed was a date. You're like, a date? What are you talking about? I needed to meet Jericho, which happened on the heels of not going to Italy. Now look what I would have missed out on. I want you to see this for a second because I wanted a dream and what I needed was a date because I needed to get married because God wanted to bring some children into the world that would go out throughout this world and make a difference. I've lived this. I've seen the faithfulness of God. I'm so thankful that he didn't give me what I wanted, but he gave me what I needed. And I believe there's some people in here today that you need this encouragement. You need to know that God is not done with you yet, that he's working in the waiting, and waiting works, and you need to get some renewed strength this morning. Do you believe it? You need to get some renewed strength in the house of God today. You need to know that he's working. He's writing a God story, and as you and I wait on the Lord by fixing our focus on Jesus and reminding ourselves of his greatness and believing God for outcomes we want, but trusting him for the outcomes we need. He says that you will find new strength, renewed strength, and you'll begin to soar high on wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary. You will walk and not faint. I want you to stand to your feet today. Because I believe that as we close, God wants to minister to two groups of people today. We're gonna create a response moment. The Bible says in this verse, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. This word renew means to exchange as taking off old clothing and putting on new. And I really believe this prophetically over your life that here's what's happening even metaphorically as I speak this. There's an exchange that's happening. You're bringing God your weakness, your frustration, and your weariness, and in return, you're receiving his power. Do you want that today? Do you want something new? Or 
Do you want to keep your eyes on others? Because if you do, you're going to be distressed. Or you can keep your eyes on yourself and you'll be depressed. Or today, you can get your eyes on Jesus and you'll be blessed. Others distressed, your 